Arts uh, Society Reading Series event. Uh, I'm Calm Cunningham on behalf of the School of Language and Liberal Studies at Fanshawe. I thank you very much for being here. Uh, we'll begin with an important acknowledgement on behalf of the college. Uh, we acknowledge and honor the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Lenape people of southwestern Ontario as the traditional owners and custodians of the lands and waterways where Fanshawe College is now located. Further, we acknowledge the cultural, uh, cultural diversity of all Indigenous peoples and pay respect to elders past, present, and future. It is my pleasure to introduce you to our guest today, Sam Shellstad. Sam began his post, his post secondary studies right here, maybe not exactly in this room, but at Fanshawe College as a student in the General Arts and Science program. Uh, after graduating with his certificate, he went to Western for a BA and then off to the West Coast for an MFA in creative writing from the University of Victoria. He's based in Toronto now, and despite having played at Call the Office uh, as his musical alter e ego, Brian Pohl, uh, and if you don't know, once you've played Call the Office in downtown London, you've basically arrived as a musician. Um, despite that, he's primarily turned his creative energies to writing fiction now. He is a contributing writer for McSweeney's Internet Tendency, uh, which is one of the best places to go online to find funny, smart writing, and where I first made the connection that the Sam Shellstad, whose story I was reading and literally laughing out loud at, was the same Sam Shellstead that I had the honor of teaching uh, when I was uh, starting my career at Fanshawe a few years ago. Uh, in addition to his writing for McSweeney's, his short stories have been published all over the place in Canadian literary magazines, uh, including The New Quarterly, The Fiddlehead, Joyland, Prism International, The Puritan, and the best title of them all, The Rusty Toot. Uh, in 2014, his story Frank was long listed for the CBC Short Story Prize, and Cop House was the runner up for the Thomas Morton Memorial Prize. That story, Cop House, ended up uh, lending its title to his debut book, which you can see here, uh, a collection of his stories which was published last year and which is available wherever the very best books are sold, including right here in this room, because the bookstore will be here at the end of the reading uh, if you'd like to buy a copy of Sam's book. Uh, here is a quick selection of words and phrases that have been used to, uh, by critics to praise the stories that make up his book. These should give you an idea of why I'm really looking forward to Sam's reading today. Here are the phrases. Very funny, slyly satirical, bittersweet, empathetic, disarming, and my three favorite phrases, genuine, nuanced, earned pathos, a tad unsavory, and the best one of all, Weird Little Dolls. So please join me in welcoming Sam Shelstad back to Fanshawe. All right, thank you so much, Alan. Thanks for having me here. It's an honor to be back here at Fanshawe. Um, yeah, I, aren't there any general arts and sciences students here? None. <laughs> oh. Alone here. Uh, are you all coming from the same class or different classes? Awesome. Uh, different classes. classes. In the same class. So, yeah. Well, we all went to Fanshawe. <laughs> uh, yeah, I had a great time here, and I wasn't writing then. I was just making music. Uh, later on, I started writing fiction, and uh, so I've got this book now, Cop House. You should all buy it afterwards. There will be books here. Um, so today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a couple stories from the book and talk about the stories and how they came about. And if you have any questions for me, uh, I'll leave time for questions at the end. Uh, that's what we'll do. Uh, are there any writers in here or people who want to be writers? We have one. There's more. Okay, well, I'm sure you all have questions for me. They're not. <laughs> all right, uh, so I'm going to start with a story uh, called Blind Man, and it's the first story in the book. It's also the first story I ever have uh, published in a magazine before. It came out in the New Quarterly. Um, all of these stories were written over a period of about five years, and this is one of the earliest ones. 
Uh, all you really need to know for this, uh, it's in the form of a letter that's left on a stranger's porch. But it's called Blind Man. Dear lovely young woman in the small house on Fader Drive, or I shouldn't lie, Juliet. I know your name is Juliet. Juliet Ireland. Such a beautiful name. Is Ireland an Irish name? I hope you do not mind my leaving this letter in your mailbox. I made sure to drop it off while you are at work so as not to frighten you. I understand that it might be startling to find a stranger like myself in your porch, especially after what happened. It was important for me to write you, however. I have three aims with this letter. One, I would like to apologize. Two, I will provide an explanation. And three, I wish to extend an invitation. I will deal with these matters in that order. First of all, I am sorry. I know what I did was inappropriate, and I regret the actions I took on Wednesday night. I do not blame you for screaming, for using the bar stool to chase me out of your house, or for the bruises I gathered falling down your front steps. The last thing I wanted was to hurt you, and I think we can both agree that I never did physically hurt you. I merely, and foolishly, I know, created a misunderstanding that may have caused you to worry. Well, worry no more. I feel that after you have read my explanation, you will understand where I was coming from, and perhaps even sympathize with me. And if you should decline the forthcoming invitation, poof, I will disappear from your life forever, though the thought of this outcome pains me to imagine. Again, I'm sorry. With that out of the way, I'm sure you are dying to know why I did what I did. Before we get to Wednesday night, or even that first time I surprised you while you were smoking, I need to take you back a few weeks to the night of April 21st. Did you know that April 21st is the city of Rome's birthday? It seems to me that our story beginning on the birthday of something as great and important as Rome is a wonderful honor. Anyway, it was a Saturday night and Jim Ruthers, an old colleague of mine, was in town for a conference. Ruthers and I once roomed together at McGill, so we stay in touch. See? Already the picture is coming together a little more clearly. This strange man you chased out of your house is no sociopath. He has friends, they stay in touch, and he went to a reputable university. So Brothers and I convened at my apartment for a few drinks to catch up. And after a couple of hours, we found that my beer supply had depleted. We both agreed that our own spirits were still well stocked, however, and so decided to walk down to a bar for further refreshments and reminiscing. I rarely enjoy alcohol, but I had not seen brothers for a few years, and the two of us felt that the old college medicine might suit the occasion. We decided on Bart's Ballroom, a youngster's hangout I am sure you are aware of, due to its proximity to your own lodgings. Normally I would prefer a more sophisticated, quiet night spot, like the Supper and Jazz Club on Lehman, but Ruthers insisted on something nearby. It was on our walk to Bart's that Ruthers suggested we play Blind Man a game from our McGill days. The premise of Blind Man is simple. All participants close their eyes and see who can make it the farthest towards the agreed upon destination without looking. But back in the day, Ruthers and I, full of youthful moxie, became quite adept at Blind Man. We traversed the streets of Montreal confidently and without injury, covering great distances, our eyes completely shut. That night, on our way to Bart's, we were a little rusty. It was good fun, however, and we eventually made it to the bar. Brothers and I downed a couple of pints, talked about the old times, and then went our separate ways. I walked home alone, and on the way, some mischievous force within cajoled me into playing blind man solo. Perhaps it was the alcohol, or maybe the excitement of rekindling my student memories. But please know this. Under normal circumstances, I would never attempt blind man alone. It's too dangerous. With a companion, you have someone to assist should there be an accident. And the communication that goes on between two players helps paint a better picture of the surroundings. I'm stepping off the curb, or there is a brick wall here. Add to one's own visualization of the area being sightlessly maneuvered through. Anyway, whatever devil took over for me, I went for it. 
And that is how I ended up in front of your house on Fader Drive. Initially, the shock I felt upon opening my eyes, finding myself in front of your house, was due to having no idea where I was. I could have sworn I was on my own street, which I'll let you know is several blocks from yours. Yes, it had been years since Ruthers and I were able to move confidently through Montreal without looking, and I had enjoyed more drink than I usually allow myself. But I know this town, and I was moving carefully and slowly. I didn't expect to land perfectly in front of my own building, but I had calculated my steps so that I would at least end up on the correct street. It took me a minute to figure out where I was, and when I spotted the street sign across from your house, I could not believe my eyes. Juliet, do you believe in fate? Or, to be clear, do you believe in signs? By signs, of course, I mean what people call the universe trying to tell one something. These operate just like ordinary messages, except that when you try to identify who has sent the message, it appears to have randomly sprung from the chaos of existence. For example, a man on a bridge preparing to jump to his death might spot a humorous piece of graffiti on the bridge wall as he is looking down. He might start to laugh, remember why it would be better to go on living, climb down safely. The graffiti was not put there because of him. At least he did not factor into the intentions of the graffiti artist. But it was there for him. It was a sign. I did not think anything of the incident on the night of April 21st. Whatever your initial impressions of me might have been, I'm not insane. When I opened my eyes in front of your house and figured out where I was, I turned around and went home. It was the following night, April 22nd, that things became interesting. At work that day, I couldn't stop thinking about how I had ended up so far from home, despite my certainty that I had been following the proper route. After dinner, I decided to walk down to Bart's and try to blind man my way home again. This time, I would be completely sober and particularly fastidious in choosing my steps. So I went. I was sober, I was careful, and when I opened my eyes expecting to see my apartment building, I saw your small house on Fader Drive. I had taken the exact path as the night before. To make an error twice is one thing, but for the two errors to be identical is another. I went back to Bart's and retraced my steps to your house eyes open this time. I tried to imagine walking to my own home as I made my way towards Fader Drive, <clears throat> but the turns, changes in elevation, and even the distance were off. It didn't make sense that I should make any of the choices I would have to make to get to your house if my intention was to walk home. I stared, confused, at the exterior of your house, and that was when I began thinking of signs. I hadn't even seen you yet. That pleasure came the following week during an encounter I'm sure you remember. It was ex exactly one week after my initial visit to your house. I was sitting at home, pondering over the mystery of Fader Drive, when I decided to give it another go. I walked down to Bart's ballroom, closed my eyes, and attempted to walk back home. This time, I visualized two routes on the map in my mind. The route to my home, and the route to yours. Whenever I made a new decision, I would calculate whether it would take me towards my apartment or towards your street and chose in favor of the former. I was about to open my eyes, certain I was approaching my building, when I heard your shout. Startled, I parted my lids and saw you back away from me. You were on your porch smoking a cigarette, and I was walking across the lawn towards you. You yelled, hey, and I ran. I can only imagine what the scene must have looked like from your perspective. You on your porch, enjoying a nice smoke, when a stranger begins walking directly towards you with his eyes closed. Then you, understandably, cry out, and the man, somewhat less understandably, bolts like a frightened cat. I can only hope, Juliet, that you are also able to see it from my perspective. The shock of your initial shout, the realization I was not crossing the lawn in front of my building, and the suddenness of being confronted by you came all at once. It was like waking from a pleasant dream to an earthquake shaking the room. It was overwhelming, and I ran on instinct. 
if I had had the appropriate time to process everything, of course I would have explained myself there and then. Life just isn't always as accommodating as we'd like it to be. So that was that. Now on to Wednesday night. Now in the interest of full disclosure, and so that any further misunderstanding might be avoided, I will admit to you that I did a little research during the interim of our initial meeting and our rather unfortunate reunion on Wednesday. While to you I was simply, and still may be, a lunatic, to me your home meant something special. It, or whatever might lie inside, is a sign. Some external force had put me there three times, despite my own efforts to avoid your street entirely. So when I tell you that I went back on a couple of nights to watch your house with binoculars from across the street, or that I peered through your windows and rifled through your garbage cans, please note my good intentions. Even when I followed you on my bicycle to your place of work, into what I assume was your mother's house, I was not stalking you. I was merely trying to interpret the sign I had been given. And this brings me to the explanation for why you found me in your bathroom on Wednesday night. To reiterate, I am not trying to justify my actions, only explain. What I did was wrong. I never should have crossed the line and entered your home. That the side window into your living room was open, however, seemed like another sign to me. I knew you were away at work and that you live alone, and so my intrusion would not cause any distress. There was a recycling bin along the side of the house to prop myself up to the window. The screen popped out easily. There was nobody around to witness the act. It seemed like fate to me. And now you know what I was doing in your house. That much should be clear. The universe was telling me that something important, something I had to see, was inside. I walked around a bit, turned on a lamp or two, and surveyed the surroundings. Nothing struck me at first, aside from the fact that you seemed to be a clean, tasteful woman of good habits. I enjoyed the Monet prints in the hallway. I'll have to order a couple for my own apartment. After a few minutes of innocent browsing, I was hit with a sudden need to use your bathroom. Again, I'm no sociopath, and the situation was causing me some stress. Breaking into strangers' homes is not something I usually do. My bowels tend to act up when I'm nervous. I realize that a bathroom is a personal space, and I never would have used your facilities if it was not an emergency. This is where you found me. So we have reached the final hurdle of my explanation. Everything up to this point should make sense now, except for the state you found me in when you came home early from work. You must now understand what I was doing in your home in the first place, but not why you should have found me shirtless and crying on your bathroom floor, clutching your bottle of hand cream. I would have been baffled too. One thing I've been thinking about over and over since the night in question is whether it was fate that brought you home from work so early. I knew from the previous week that you normally finish your shifts at the restaurant around 10 or 11. Why on this particular night would you come home shortly after 8? I'm sure there was a good reason. Maybe you were not feeling well, or it was a slow night. But maybe there was also a reason. Maybe you were supposed to catch me. I'm not sure what you thought I was doing, and I can only imagine what leaps your mind might have made given the scene presented. But here's what happened. After relieving myself, I was washing up in your sink when I noticed my shirt was on inside out. This mistake has happened to you before, I'm sure. While caught up in the mystery and excitement of your home and what might be waiting for me inside, I left my apartment in a rush and did not notice my error. So I took my shirt off in your bathroom with the intention of putting it back on the correct way. Before I could do so, however, I was struck by my own image in the mirror. I'm not sure exactly what it was, but it felt right. There are few occasions where I find myself bare-chested outside of my own apartment. And when I saw myself standing exposed in your bathroom, I thought, this is home. Please don't take this for more than what it is. It's just a passing thought. Something felt good about looking at myself in your mirror, as if I lived there with you. Anyway, I was looking in your mirror when I noticed a patch of dry skin on my left shoulder. Nothing to be alarmed by, just something I hadn't noticed. I'd switched to a cheaper laundry detergent a few weeks prior, which was probably the cause. 
I found the hand cream above your sink, thinking it wouldn't be a big deal to borrow a squirt for my shoulder. And then the scent hit my nose. It was my mother. She was crushed by a train when I was six, and I can't remember much about her. Just random images and feelings. But when the smell of your hand cream wafted before me, I could see her. A perfect image of my mother presented itself to me. She was wearing a green dress, sitting beside my bed, reading me a story. I could even hear her voice, which I had never been able to remember before. I sat down on the floor and cried. It was a powerful moment. Through my sobs, I guess I failed to hear you come in the house. The rest of the story, you already know. You came into the bathroom, probably to investigate the strange noises you heard through the door, and found the man who had approached you blindly the week before. You screamed, ran into the kitchen. I followed you. I was hoping to explain myself then and there, but you chased me out with the bar stool. I'm sure I would have reacted the same way were we to switch places. In the commotion, I fell down your front steps, but managed to pull myself up and run off. I was not aware of this at the time, but in case you didn't notice, I accidentally took your hand cream with me. Perhaps, subconsciously, I wanted to bring my mother home with me. And you have my shirt. Well, this brings us to the final matter, the invitation. You now know my side of the story, and I can only hope you will trust my disclosure has been complete and honest. It may seem to you, as it did to me at first, that the sign I was given has been delivered in full. That perhaps the entire reason I was meant to find your home was to discover the cream and, in effect, a piece of my late mother. Something, call it intuition, tells me that our story is not over, however. The cream is important, and I will always cherish the fact that I was able to find it in your bathroom. But something about you and your house on Fader Drive still resonates with me. Maybe it was what I saw in the mirror, that feeling of being home. Don't worry, I won't break in again. I've realized my error and would never want to cause you further distress. What I propose instead is that we meet. I'm sure you know Wendell Park by the brewery. Meet me there on Monday afternoon at 2 o'clock by the fountain. You can't miss it. I know you have the day off. Hopefully you're not visiting your mother. Bring my shirt. I will bring your cream. We can talk. If you allow me, I would love to keep the cream, but of course it is yours and I will return it if that's what you prefer. If you choose to show up with a team of muscular men or even the police, I am helpless to stop you. The ball is in your court. I only hope that through reading this, you have come to understand me and why I want to meet. The universe is trying to tell me something, and you, Juliet, are a key part of it. I am putting my faith in you, in the idea that this world contains meaning. And that's the end. Thank you. That's the first story in the book. If you buy my book, you can, you can skip it, because you've already heard it. <laughs> we'll start with story two. Um, yeah, I'll just talk a little bit about that story, uh, how it came about. So the, the game Blind Man is something that my friends and I used to play when I was younger. Probably some of you played a version of that as well. Anyone ever tried to walk somewhere with their eyes closed? Yeah. We didn't call it Blind Man. I made that up for the story, but we used to do that. So I was thinking about that and how I could, uh, if it could be a story. And then I thought of the idea of what if you were playing that and you kept ending up somewhere up completely away from where you thought you would end up. Um, and what if you just kept ending up there, like it was trying to tell you something? So I had that little nugget, uh, and I wasn't sure what to do with it. And I thought, well, what if you ended up at the house and you fell in love with that person, like a little romantic story? And I was thinking about how to write that, and I realized there was something inherently creepy about that. Uh, and then that's when this, the character became a, a stalker. <laughs> and. Um, yeah, I came up with the idea of uh, writing it as a letter left on the porch, and it sort of worked backwards to try to figure out how this person would explain themselves in a way that maybe uh, they thought would come across as romantic or poetic, but 
makes it even more creepy. So that's sort of where that story came from. Uh, yeah, one of the earliest stories I wrote that's in the book. Uh, there's 16 stories in here, and I'm going to read them all. <laughs> uh, I'm going to read one more story. I'm going to read part of another story. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not going to finish this story, so there'll be a cliffhanger, and then you'll just you'll have to buy the book. So that won't happen. Uh, so all you need to know for this story is that it's written from the perspective of a polar bear. So if you have a hard time imagining a, a polar bear when you can see me up here reading it, just close your eyes and picture a polar bear. Uh, so it's called New Ice Kingdom. And it's about a polar bear who's kind of uh, in exile and trying to figure out uh, what to do. Right, you'll get the sense. So this is New Ice Kingdom. <clears throat> things different in New Ice Kingdom, but things also same. Things same. Snow, water, ice, ice holes. Spend most of time at ice holes. Sun come during day as always, then go away at night. Things different. Not as many polar bear, just me. That means no bud, bud my son. Miss bud, not so much miss others. Also different, not good at killing seal. Before was good at killing seal. To kill seal, first find ice hole. Wait by ice hole, maybe for a long time. When seal comes up for air, there is smell of seal's breath. When smell seal's breath in hole, reach down and kill seal by biting head. If flopping, bash with paw. When seal dead from head bite, bashing, drag to nice spot, eat. Or, if not hungry, bury in secret spot for later. Was very good at this in old ice kingdom. Ate lots of seal, gave seal bits to sun, bud. Also gave seal bits to other, less good seal killers like Mori, who is Mooch. Since come to New Ice Kingdom, not so good at killing seal. Hesitate. New Ice Kingdom has ice holes and seals. Seals swim to ice holes for air. All normal. But when smells seal breath now, not quick. Hesitate. Seal go back down. Last meal, long time ago. Sun come and go away 100 times or more. So, hungry. Today, maybe good day. Optimistic. Find ice hole, lay down. Wait at ice hole. No seal breath. Wait long time, then go away. Find new ice hole. At new ice hole, lay down. Wait at ice hole. Wait very long time, and when about to go away, seal breath. Hesitate. Seal go back down. Hungry. Later, sun go away. While sun going away, thank sun for day. Even though not good day. No catch seal. But not sun's fault. Maybe tomorrow better. Dig small pit in ice. Sleep. Today, meet friend. No friends in New Ice Kingdom until now. Was at ice hole waiting for seal breath. Waited long time, then smelled seal breath. Hesitated. Seal go back down. Then heard noise. Turned around, saw fox. Thought was bud at first. Same size, color, but not bud. Fox. Fox looked hungry. Wanted seal bits? But no seal, so walk away. Would have given fox seal bits, because fox friend, but no seal. So fox go away. Later, go to different ice hole. Lay down, wait, no seal breath. Wait long time, no seal breath. See fox in distance, waiting for seal bits, but no seal. So fox go away. Decide to spy on old ice kingdom. Have to be sneaky because of Mori. Walk long time, see old ice kingdom across water. Big swim from new ice kingdom to old ice kingdom. Water gap good boundary. Hide behind snow pile near shore. Look at old ice kingdom. 
see Bud. Bud with Maury. Bud Maury's son now? No, Bud's still my son. Miss Bud. Not so much Miss Maury. Hear noise. Look back. Fox. Fox followed. Fox good. Fox friend. Maybe Fox thinking about seal bits. But not killing seal now. Spying on Sun and Maury. Good team, me and Fox. Sidekicks. We'll call Fox Foxy. Go on adventures. Kill seal and get Foxy seal bits. Foxy and Bear. Fall asleep on snow pile. Wake up. Bud gone. Maury gone. Foxy gone. Go back to New Ice Kingdom. Hungry. Tired. Sun go away. Thanks sun for day. Thanks sun for Foxy. Today good day because have new friend. Also bad day because no seal. Dig small pit in ice. Sleep. I'm going to skip the next day. It's a little adventure with Foxy. <laughs> All right. Today, very desperate. Hungry. Almost did bad thing. When sun came, went to ice hole. Foxy near, waiting for seal bits. Waited, smelled seal breath. Hesitated. Seal go back down. Hungry. Went to secret spot, dug up secret thing. This not good. Should not dig up secret thing. But hungry, so did. Secret thing still there, buried deep in snow. Same, bite marks on head. Good condition. Very hungry, but want to be good dad for Bud, so put back. It's very hard to do because of hungry. Put secret thing back in secret spot. Went to ice hole. Wait at ice hole. No seal breath. Foxy watch, then go away. Sun go away. Thanks sun for day. Thanks sun for Foxy. Thanks sun for dad who talked to me good and not eat secret thing. Dig small pit. Sleep. Today not good day. Hungry. Do not leave pit. Should probably go to ice hole with Foxy, but tired. Sun looking down like why still in pit? Why not go to ice hole and try again? Still not get up. In pit, thinking of old ice kingdom. Miss old ice kingdom. Miss Bud. Remember being cub, Bud's age, playing ice hole game. So much fun when cub. Would go with friend, find two ice holes near each other. Would dive into first ice hole, swim in water under ice until come out of second ice hole. Scary because what if couldn't find other ice hole, but always did because smart. Learned ice hole game from dad. Dad was good dad. Later taught ice hole game to Bud, so good dad as well. Except ice hole game, how bad thing happened. So maybe not good dad now. Thinking about bad thing, feel bad for Maury. Although feel bad for self because miss Bud. At least Bud is still here. Lori's son not here because of that thing. Remember was waiting by ice hole in old ice kingdom. This was before when good at killing seal. Bud nearby playing ice hole game with Maury's son. Bud and Maury's son, best friends. Was waiting, then heard noise in ice hole. Smelled breath, did not hesitate. Reach down with paw, grab seal, bit head, not seal. First thought was bud, very scary, but not bud, thanks son. But was Maury's son, not good. Bud run over, see best friend with blood on head, see dad with blood on mouth. Bud cry, this very bad. Bud run off, scared of own dad? not chase after. When Maury find out, maybe Maury try and kill one who bites son's head. So take Maury's son in mouth, run away. Swim across to New Ice Kingdom, bury Maury's son in secret spot. Not good dad like own dad. Son go away. 
Thanks, sun, for day, even though whole day in pit. Hungry. Bad thoughts. And I'm going to stop there. That one. So if you want to find out what happened to the polar bear, you have to buy the book. Or you can ask me. Spoil it. Uh, so that story came about. Um, I just I saw a photograph of a polar bear swimming around with its little baby cub on its back. Uh, there's a scene in here that where that happens. And I was just looking at it, so I was thinking about polar bears, and I thought oh, maybe I could write a story about a polar bear. And I thought of a relationship between a father and son, and what I could do with that. And then um, I wanted to write it in a polar bear language, but I didn't want to. I didn't want it to see. I didn't want it to be like, oh, as a polar bear, I think I shall go out into the day and explore the sun. I didn't want to write it like that. But I didn't want to make up like a grunt language. So I tried to find, uh, come up with a way of, uh, of writing it that just felt to me like this polar bear. Um, so I played around a lot. It's just, you know, mostly bad grammar, but uh, gets the point across. Uh, so it was a fun one to write. Uh, that's in here. Um, are there any questions so far? Questions about the book, stories, uh, writing questions, the creative process? Yes? Originally, I was going to ask you why you chose to write humorous pieces, but the polar bear one doesn't seem like it's going to have a funny ending. <laughs> so uh, I'm assuming you like to write in a variety of different sort of styles and yeah. genres, maybe? I do like to play around. When I start a story, I want to try and do something new. But I think there is an element of humor to all of my stories that I can't get away from. Um, like some of these stories in here, I tried to write them very serious, just dark, full of emotion, and uh, I can't help but just throw jokes in there. Um, I like a lot of funny writers. Um, that's just something I'm interested in. Um, but yeah, dark humor seems to just be what I go to when I write. Uh, any other questions? Yes? Are there any particular writers who have influenced your style? Or you kind of just run off on your own, or do you ever try to intentionally emulate kind of the writer's style? Yeah, um, I never try like on purpose to to emulate another writer's style, but I think it just happens. Uh, if I really am into a writer or some other writers, it just kind of comes through because I just uh, I love what I'm reading and I I want to do something like that. Yeah, some of the like dark, funny writers. I really love uh, Flannery O'Connor. Uh, have you read Flannery O'Connor, anyone in the class? <laughs> yeah, she's great. Um, she has uh, two novels out and uh, several short stories. And uh, yeah, she, they're so, they're brutal and dark, but they're, they're hilarious too. And she just um, she's a hoot to read. Um, yeah, I really like Kafka, who I think you would think of as being sort of just dark and weird, but there is, I think, a strong element of humor to his work, too. It's, it's just, he deals with absurdity, and uh, that can always be funny, so that's something I like. Um, oh, there's all kinds of writers I love. I'm always reading. Uh, any other questions? From writing your earliest stories to your more recent ones, if you're thinking back to the earliest stories that you write or that you wrote, um, are there any like lessons that you think your current writing self could have offered to your original writing self? Uh, yeah, um, I think definitely. Um, I think when I was first starting to write stories. I didn't really think about plot a lot. I thought about character and style and just trying to come up with an interesting concept. And I didn't really know a lot about how to plot out a story. Um, 
like that blind man story there, the plot really is just revealing what he did and making an excuse for it. Like it does, it's not really a strong plot. It's just co sort of going through. Um, he's just explaining what happened. Um, but I think it, it works for that story, I think. Um, whereas maybe more recent stories, I'm thinking about how a character will make decisions that affect the story and how that will lead to uh, different events. Um, everything is comes from the character itself. But I would also say that every time I write a story, I'm always, I always have to think, like, how do you write a short story? I thought maybe after writing a few, I would sort of have the formula down and I would know how to do it. But um, yeah, I always have to sort of be like, OK, how do I do this? And I, I can never remember. So you have to sort of make it up every time. So I'm kind of always learning how to write a story. And it's, yeah, sometimes I'll write something and it just doesn't work and it's horrible and I move on to the next one. And sometimes it just seems to work. Uh, yeah. I always think that short stories are more impactful and more visually focused than a novel or other types of stories. And it sounds to me like you do get your images from some sort of visual image, like the picture of the polar bear or something like that. Um, how do you take that visual snapshot and, and work with that through your creative process to develop your, your story? And how do you know how do you know when your story's done? Like how do you formulate that short story with still some impact without feeling like there's more to say? Okay. Um, it, it doesn't always come with an image, but that is often it. It'll be just some kernel of an idea, something I'm interested in. Like with the first story, it was just remembering playing that dumb game where you walk around without looking and see if you can get to a place. Um, that one was a picture of these polar bears. Um, there's one story in here. Um, I saw it. This was a picture I saw of someone had a beware of dog sign on their fence, and there were uh, bite marks out of it. And they're just like, like the dogs so bad, it tried to eat the sign that was warning you about the dog. So I was thinking about that, and then I, I wrote the story about um, the man who's so obsessed with his home security that he keeps escalating these different ruses to get people to think that they, they shouldn't uh, infiltrate his house, um, things like that. So. Yeah, it's always usually some small thing, and then as I think about it after a while, the story just kind of starts to form itself. Um, the second part of your question about how do you know when a story is finished? Um, that's it's hard. That's one of the things. Like when I said, I always have to figure out how to write a story from scratch. Um, you don't really know, like. You might have a sense of where you want to end up, but where do you actually? Where does the story stop? When do you finish with it? And it's kind of intuitive every time. Uh, does it feel done? Like it just? You get to a point and you're like, oh, I can't write anymore. And then even then, uh, I usually do a lot of editing. I'll leave a story uh, for a while and come back to it maybe months later and work on it. And maybe it's at a point where you can't edit it anymore. If, if I if I change another thing, I'm just going to ruin it. So it's as good as it can be. That's kind of um, when it's done. But even then, most of the stories in this book are published in magazines. Um, so it felt like I was done when I sent the story to the magazine. And then they published it, but they, I had to edit it with the editor. So but then we had to edit it again to make it finished again. And then when it came out in the book, I edited all the stories all over again, so they keep changing. I could probably re-release this book like, and edit everything into oblivion, but at a certain point I think you just have to let it go. So the simple answer is, I guess, when it feels done. Uh, any other questions? Yes? What made you decide to move to writing instead of continuing with music? Um, question, why did I do that? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I used to play in a lot of bands and I wrote songs and stuff and I loved doing that. But when I was writing songs, I think the lyrics became more and more story-like. 
um, I, instead of like some poetic image or something, I was just telling a story and uh, very folk song like. And then I think that that just got me interested. Like, oh, maybe I could actually just write a story with a guitarist playing in the background. And uh, and so I just I, I tried writing and I did both for a long time. And then eventually I just got so busy with writing and interested in it uh, that stopped playing in band. Yes. Did you decide to start submitting your stories to magazines? And was there a particular reason for that, or just seemed like the next step? Yes. Uh, I think once I had a story that I was kind of happy with, um, I think I, I, I had friends who had had uh, stories in magazines and that, and thought, oh, I, I want to be, I want to do that too. Uh, so I started setting them off and. Um, I'm sure there was a lot of rejections before anything got accepted into a magazine. Uh, if any of you are interested in publishing short stories in magazines, you have to face a lot of rejection. Because uh, even a small literary magazine in Canada, there's so many people submitting their stories and like, poems and, and whatever to them. They're just, they can only accept so much. So even if you have a, a brilliant story, it will, it's very good chance to get rejected. So you have to kind of uh, plow away and just keep sending your stuff out and have hope. And sometimes the story is no good and you don't realize it till later. So, uh, but sometimes the story is good and it finds a home. So it can be kind of fun to send your stuff out. Uh, anyone else? If there are no more questions, then I think we want to make sure we leave time for the book sale and the signing. Uh, so we'll conclude our event now. Um, the books are available for uh, sale. They're Wendy's from the bookstores. Bring them up to the front. Um, so one more time, uh, please join me in welcoming Sam back to Fanshawe and thanking him very much for being here.